Hello, this is Dr. Taylor, and I want to have a detailed discussion about saliva testing as a method for measuring bioavailable levels of steroid hormones. Uh, discovering this uh, about 20 years ago uh, really changed the course of my career. Uh, being a, a resident at uh, Emory University and Emory University Hospitals as an OBGYN resident, uh, we never tested hormones. Uh, I was never taught to test hormones in the serum. Uh, we didn't. We had no use for testing hormones. Uh, I didn't question that because I was in a caterpillar line, and I didn't understand why we didn't do that. Uh, but it's because uh, in the book, and we'll show that in just a second, is that uh, serum levels of hormones uh, do not give uh, clinically useful information, as you see here. Uh, so what we did was what I talk about uh, in my earlier lecture, gynecology made simple. Young people got birth control pills, older people got hormone replacement. You decided to give them a progestin based on whether or not they had a uterus. And this was very uh, simple. You really didn't have to understand hormones at all. And this is what we did. Uh, now, a lot of people are saying, are trying to teach you to use serum levels of hormones in order to determine who needs hormones and uh, who doesn't. And it didn't work back then and it doesn't work now. And I don't care what kind of calculations you do, if you add FSH to the equation, it still is not a reliable measurement of hormones. Serum measurements is not very reliable. And so therefore, instead of uh, just making do with what you have, we need to be looking at a better, more reliable way to determine who needs hormones, what hormone they need, and once they are on the hormones, how do we monitor them? Uh, hopefully you have just completed the uh, lecture on why hormones behave differently in different people. And you can see that you can give the same dose of hormone to uh, one person that you give to another, but if they have uh, different endogenous production of hormones, or if they have different rates of metabolism of the hormone, that hormone is going to affect that person uh, differently uh, than the other person. So we need to know how to monitor the tissue levels of the hormones and not just what is in the serum. Now, this is a book uh, that is written uh, by a lab that does all Three. It does uh, serum, urine, and saliva. So they have no uh, bias toward one, heart, one measurement or the other, one way of measure or the other. And it states in there that hormones measured in the serum are considered the gold standard uh, of hormone testing. However, measurement of serum hormone levels is not without its limitations. Serum levels change more slowly, so the effects of treatment are not as quickly observable. When exogenous hormones are introduced, serum, urinary, and saliva levels do not correlate. So again, once you give a hormone that is outside or that comes from somewhere other than the, uh, the specialized tissue, then serum, urinary, and salivary levels, they don't correlate much at all. And the reason why is that lymphatic and red blood cell delivery of hormones are not mirrored by the serum. Again, the steroid hormones are lipid soluble, so they're going to go more toward lipid soluble areas. And the red blood cell, um, cell membrane is lipid soluble, so it's going to be able to deliver that steroid hormone. In the serum, if it is uh, hydrophilic, then the serum is going to reflect more of what's going on. But since they are, uh, these are lipophilic, then there is delivery through the lymphatic and the red blood cells, and you don't see that in the serum. Now, sometimes when you read the literature and don't really understand the physiology, uh, biases that you don't know that you have can be revealed. Now, this, uh, this article says, caution on the use of saliva measurements to monitor absorption of progesterone from transdermal creams in postmenopausal women. So, so let's, let's look at their reasoning, that there were small increases in plasma progesterone levels and 
pregnant diol three glucuronide uh, excretion compared to the placebo group and red cell progesterone levels never exceeded plasma levels during progesterone cream use. Okay, so they didn't see any uh, increase in uh, concentration in the serum. But they said saliva progesterone levels are very high and variable in the progesterone cream groups compared to the placebo group and presented a paradox to the usual relationship or what we are used to seeing or what is uh, generally accepted the relationship observed between plasma and saliva progesterone in premenopausal women. So in premenopausal women, they hadn't uh, introduced any exogenous hormones. Now they have introduced exogenous hormones, and according to the laboratory, it says once you do that, you are not going to, those levels of serum and saliva are not going to correlate. But here's their conclusion, that the absorption of progesterone from transdermal creams is low. Now, even though they saw the high level in the saliva, their assumption is, is that your body really didn't absorb the cream because they don't see it in the plasma. We caution against the use of saliva measurements to monitor progesterone absorption. And I can tell you how many patients I've seen that are suffering the side effects of either too much estrogen, too much testosterone, or too much progesterone. And the doctor keeps increasing the dose and tells them that they're not absorbing it because their serum levels are not increasing. So that's the same kind of reasoning that this article is using is that I see it one place, I, see, I don't see it in another place. I'm going to assume that the high level is wrong and for some reason it's just not being absorbed instead of understanding that another way of measuring the hormone may be more accurate than the way I am used to measuring the hormone. Now, this is a study done in rats where they applied topical progesterone and then sacrificed the uh, rats four weeks later. And what they saw was that uh, these results demonstrate that topically applied progesterone is rapidly absorbed transdermally and that its patterns of distribution and metabolism are comparable to those previously reported for intravascular administration. So, uh, topical administration distributed the progesterone to the organs as well as when they gave intravascular progesterone. And they also saw that different uh, tissues uh, absorbed the hormone at different rates. So we know that the uterus and the breasts, which are uh, hormone sensitive, they absorbed it uh, more than other, other organs. Now, according to this laboratory textbook, saliva is not perfect. Now, where the serum only has about 1% that is actually free and unbound, saliva has about 50% that is unbound. So it gives you more of an idea of what is actually uh, in the tissue. Uh, if you're using a trochee, then saliva can be contaminated. Uh, the, the laboratory evaluations book says they should be off the trochee for at least 24 to 48 hours. Uh, so that uh, what uh, hormone that may be uh, in the mouth, uh, left over in the mouth, does not uh, contaminate it. Uh, bacteria in the mouth may affect levels in the saliva. But at the end, the book on uh, which uh, the book says on, uh, uh, tells about which uh, method of measurement may be the most reliable. Uh, the last bullet point here says hormones appear to be reliably tested for in saliva. So this book that has no bias uh, toward doing salivary testing, blood or urine, they provide all three, says that hormones appear to be reliably, uh, reliably tested for in saliva. Now, it is not my opinion that there are problems with measuring uh, hormones in serum. Uh, the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism in 2013 has an article on the challenges to the measurement of estradiol. And what you see in this article is that a number of studies suggest that current routine clinical assays do not meet the needs set out above. Indeed, concerns about the analytical performance in the measurement of E2 or estradiol among different assays and concentrations have been reported for over 20 years. So that's why we didn't measure hormones in the saliva as a resident. The limit of quantitation of most direct amino assays ranges from 30 to 100 picograms per ml, which is insufficient for measurements in children, 
postmenopausal women, men and women taking aromatase inhibitors, even mass spectrometry-based uh, methods, and indirect RIAs that have been recommended for such low concentrations may have difficulties with levels less than five picograms. Concerns about the specificity of current E2 assays have been raised for many years. Finding one from one study indicate that interfering compounds may cause E2 measured values to be 10 times higher than the true value. The study also suggests that the concentration of interfering substances in patient samples can vary greatly from patient to patient. For some reason, for, I'm sorry, for the same reasons, it was suggested that E2 plasma levels using some direct immunoassays measured in women taking aromatase inhibitors are most likely artifacts rather than E2 values, true E2 values. This is of particular importance because failure of success of the treatment may wrongly be attributed to a serum E2 concentration that does not reflect the true effect. So measuring hormones in the serum is misleading. I don't know how else to say that. So these are several articles looking at measuring hormones through the saliva. And these are, some of them are old, some of them are new. But uh, this has been around for a long time. This is not some new finding that you can look at hormones in the saliva. Uh, I think it's just uh, a matter of people are used to looking for uh, uh, bio biomarkers in the blood. They're just not used to asking patients to co collect saliva. You can't send them to LabCorp or Quest uh, to get their saliva uh, levels drawn. This has to be something that has, is initiated in the office, and people just aren't used to doing it. So this looks at luteal phase salivary progesterone levels, 1% to 1.3% of the corresponding plasma levels in ovulation-induced cycles. These findings indicate that salivary progesterone may be a useful and convenient alternative to plasma progesterone for assessing ovulation. Uh, this looks at, there is a high significant correlation between plasma and salivary progesterone levels throughout the menstrual cycle. And again, in the premenopausal uh, woman, there is some correlation. However, uh, when you add the exogenous hormones, then it becomes a problem looking at it in the serum. But it does say free unbound progesterone is determined by equilibrium dialysis gave uh, a mean level, as you see before, in the proliferative phase and increased significantly during the secretory phase. We conclude that ovarian function is altered in a significant number of infertile, infertile women with endometriosis. However, these alterations are often subtle and only detected by detailed investigation. And the detailed investigation they're talking about is salivary uh, estrogen and progesterone levels throughout the cycle. The, one of the uh, great things about saliva is they can be done at home at certain times of the month. They don't have to go to a lab or come to the office. Uh, you can look at um, the menstrual cycle and look at hormone production uh, throughout the cycle by asking the woman to give you uh, collect samples of saliva over the course of the total men menstrual cycle usually two to three days apart. This says that a variety of aberrations and profiles of salivary progesterone secretion was detected in all groups of endometriosis patients and the frequency of normal cycles was significantly lower than in control. So these uh, patients were actually doing uh, salivary testing over, this, uh, over the cycle and they were actually having menstrual cycles every month, but uh, they saw that a lot of these were uh, and ovulatory. Uh, the other abnormalities found in salivary progesterone profiles of these patients included pre ovulatory peaks. These results suggest that patients with prolonged unexplained infertility represent a heterogeneous population with common luteal phase defects. The disturbances effectively correlate with treatments uh, stimulating gonadotropin secretion. I just want to show you that these studies were all using salivary. Uh, progesterone and estrogen levels because it gives you more of an overall view of what's going on through the menstrual cycle in these infertile patients. And, and uh, I just want to, we don't have to read all of these, but I just want to show you that in research, especially looking at infertile uh, premenopausal women, that uh, they use salivary uh, testing.
Again, why? Because collecting saliva is an attractive alternative to the more conventional procedures because of the ease of frequent collection and freedom from religious and social constraints. You can see this, they were looking at subfertile women. Uh, this is looking at salivary measurements of E2, where the endocrine society said that we have trouble with measuring uh, estrogen or uh, estradiol in uh, serum, and it may not show the true effect. You can see here saliva measurements of E2 and progesterone can be used as a non-invasive method for assessment of ovarian function. Daily luteal progesterone levels. This is just these are just more studies to see that saliva progesterone is not something that is um, you know uh, out of the ordinary. It's not uh, something that is on the fringe. It is a part of uh, research. Our results suggest that daily salivary progesterone profiles during the luteal phase and the simple estimation of mid luteal salivary progesterone appear to be useful for the diagnosis of luteal phase defects. Salivary progesterone measurements reflect serum concentration and provide an attractive alternative to serum measurements. It should become increasingly popular in the gynecological and endocrinological investigations, especially in longitudinal studies. Serum progesterone and these are just, and all of these uh, articles, I think I uh, have either the abstract or the actual article uh, as a part of this course. I have been talking about this for a long time. I just want you to see that uh, it is not something that I dreamed up, but there's article after article. This is from the Clinical uh, uh, Journal of Clinical Chemistry. Um, we can just keep going. Uh, this is the article, Sensitive Salivary Estradiol. We see that serum estradiol, going to, according to the Endocrine Society, is not very sensitive, where salivary estradiol is very sensitive. And this is just a uh, excerpt from that article. We can keep going. I just want you to see Journal of Steroid Biochemistry, 1983. Determination of salivary progesterone concentrations in samples collected by women daily over extended periods of time provides a valuable means of assessing ovarian function. Such assays may be used to monitor ovulation induction therapy. Uh, measurement, this is, this is clinical endocrinology, measurement of salivary cortisol. Now, salivary cortisol uh, has become the gold standard for diagnosing Cushing's disease and looking at adrenal uh, dysfunction. Uh, salivary but not serum or urinary levels of progesterone are elevated after topical application of progesterone cream to pre- and postmenopausal women. So again, once you give an exogenous source of hormone, then serum levels are, are definitely not going to tell you much. This conclusion, salivary progesterone measurements confirm that topically apply, applied progesterone is absorbed despite the lack of change in serum progesterone concentrations. However, at the dose administered, serum progesterone levels do not reach those observed after oral or vaginally delivered progesterone preparations. Higher doses may be required to induce biological responses within the endometrium. The statement that higher doses may be required to induce bio biologic responses within the endometrium, uh, that's probably not correct. Those studies have already been done. Uh, there are studies to show that uh, normal levels of salivary progesterone in postmenopausal women uh, was able to produce uh, secretory endometrium in the uterus. Uh, there was not an increase in proliferative endometrium, even though the serum level was not changed very much, the salivary level uh, did show that there was adequate progesterone and the uh, endometrium showed the, the expected secretory changes. This article says, after application of topical progesterone, saliva and capillary blood levels are approximately 10 to 100 fold greater, respectively, than those seen in serum or whole blood. High capillary blood and saliva levels indicate high absorption and transport of progesterone to tissues. Reliance on serum levels of progesterone for monitoring topical dose could lead to underestimation of tissue levels and consequent overdose. And this is in the Journal of Menopause in 2013. Uh, I don't know uh, how much more information we uh, need uh, to see that uh, you're not going to 
really understand what is going on in a patient if you are following a patient uh, based on serum levels of hormones. Assessment of bioavailability of oral micronized progesterone using salivary progesterone uh, enzyme immunoassay, thus supporting the current concept of a relatively rapid diffusion of steroids from plasma to saliva. The use of non-invasive saliva sampling showed a considerable advantage in this present study. Uh, this is an article that uh, I think all of you should read. It is a part of the course of uh, one of the downloadable articles. This is in the Journal of Clinical Chemistry and it looks at the current status, status of salivary hormone analysis. And the summary says, although saliva has not yet become a mainstream sample source of hormone analysis, it has proven to be reliable and in some cases even superior to other body fluids. Nevertheless, much effort will be required for this approach to receive acceptance over the long term, especially by clinicians. So what it's saying is that there's no doubt about it, it's better, it's more reliable, but it's going to take time for clinicians to accept it. And that is just how medicine is. It's slow to accept anything uh, that it is not used to doing. Uh, this is uh, salivary testing has been around since the 1960s. This is, uh, we're well into the 2000s and it's still not being readily recept, uh, accepted. Again, this is something that changed my career. Uh, I think a lot of clinicians out there are struggling trying to make serum measurements of hormones work. Uh, uh, there are a lot of people teaching how to make serum levels of hormones work. Uh, and it, it won't. Uh, it just doesn't. That's just how the body works. We need to accept it and we need to move on. Uh, so I hope this helps. I, I encourage you to just try it. Don't have any bias toward it. Don't, you know, a, a lot of people tell me, well, why don't we measure the serum and measure uh, the saliva and then let's see which one is correct. Well, both of them are correct. They're measuring different things. And if you try to make them correlate and if the saliva doesn't correlate with the blood, you disregard the saliva. That's exactly what happened in that journal article because they were different, we rejected the new information because we wanted to continue to believe the old information. And that's not what medicine and science is about. You don't reject new information because you feel more comfortable with the old information. Uh, I have a slide that says, uh, courage is the power to let go of the familiar. And we've got to let go with being familiar with ordering blood tests. And we've got to have the courage to do something different, especially when all the evidence is staring us in the face. So as you can see, I'm very passionate about this because, I, because we don't use this, I see patients being mistreated. And when I say mistreated, uh, not because the doctor is trying to do something wrong, but it's trying to use bad information to make good decisions. And we need to make good decisions based on good information. So I hope this helps you. Uh, read some of the articles. As I always say, don't believe a word I say. Read it for yourself, and you make that decision.